All right, hello everybody. It's Dr. Alex Earl. We're here at Pure Plastic Surgery today, and it's Hump Day with Dr. Alex Earl. Uh, and this is the time I get to spend with you guys and answer a whole bunch of questions, okay? Uh, and of course, go over plastic surgery topics to, to keep everyone here uh, informed, okay? All right, so today, uh, I want to start off, I want to kick off the Hump Day Live here uh, with uh, a procedure that we recently introduced uh, which we are calling the Miami Makeover. Yeah, uh, we're really, really excited about this. Um, and so we recently kind of, you know, started to introduce that. And, um, and I kind of wanted to get into it a little bit here today, kind of explain uh, a little bit about what it is, uh, also what it is not. Uh, and then also try to get into a little bit into, you know, what patients actually qualify for this. Because uh, I do have to be very selective in terms of, you know, who is a good candidate for this procedure, okay? All right, so, so to start off, you know, what, what is the, the, the Miami Makeover? So the Miami Makeover is basically a breast procedure combined with liposuction uh, and typically combined with, uh, I mean, more specifically, combined with high definition uh, or HD type of lipo, okay? So I've done a, a talk about HD lipo a few weeks ago now. Um, you can probably, if you want to go back, you can find that talk on our, on our IGTV at, at Pure Plastic Surgery on IG, or you can go to um, our YouTube channel, Pure Plastic Surgery YouTube channel, and you can find that talk there as well, where we go into quite a bit of detail regarding HD lipo. But in a nutshell, what is HD lipo? HD lipo is when we really define the abdomen, so we want to define the, the, you know, the, the muscles of the abdomen, uh, and mainly, uh, especially for women, that's the, uh, the rectus muscles, which are the ones that kind of go up and down, okay? Uh, and then and what we call the oblique muscles will come off a little bit off to the side here, okay? Um, and women, we typically don't do kind of the six pack, you know, the hash marks across the, the, the side, uh, you know, in the horizontal pattern there. Uh, but we do that for, for men, okay? Uh, so, the, so just to kind of summarize that, so what is the Miami Makeover? It is a breast procedure, so breast enhancement type of procedure, whether it's breast augmentation or breast lift with implant, okay, combined with an HD liposuction type procedure. So we have, uh, I'm going to show you a few examples of a uh, few patients we've done here. Uh, so this is one uh, patient here. Uh, her breasts are a little bit challenging in the sense that they're very, very asymmetrical. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see that up there, but mm -hmm. she had like a much smaller breast here with an inframammary fold that was much higher. Uh, so we had to work with that there as well. Uh, so she got, uh, you know, bilateral implants. I lowered her inframammary fold. Uh, her breasts are a lot more symmetrical now. And then of course we did that HD lipo to her belly. So you can see her obliques are more defined here now, as well as her rectus muscles. Uh, of course her waist has come in as well. Uh, so very, very beautiful result uh, for her here, okay? All right, and then we have this patient's another example. Now, instead of just doing a breast dog or kind of a, you know, breast kind of reconstructive type procedure like we did with her, um, you, we, here we used, uh, we actually did a breast lift with implants, okay? So she needed a lift, you know, she had totic breast, she had very, you know, a lot of emptiness here in the upper pole of the breast. So she did require that anchor type uh, pattern uh, and of course an implant as well. So she has now beautiful kind of rounded out breast. She's got very nice upper pole fullness there. Her nipple position is back to the front of the breast where it's supposed to be. And then of course we did the HD lipo. Uh, she's a bit early here uh, post-op, so um, she'll be actually much more defined, you know, as the, as the weeks and the months go by. But you can already tell her waist is smaller. She's got uh, more definition for her abs there um, as well. Okay, and then I'm going to show you one more example because we this patient we, we followed uh, quite a bit longer now, so you can see how things kind of transition, um, you know, uh, as you go, you know, in the post op, same post op, you know, month one, month two, month three. Okay, so again, this is a classic Miami makeover here, so we're doing breast augmentation in HD lipo. Okay, so this one's a little bit more straightforward in the sense that you know, she's just a straight breast augmentation. Uh, no other maneuvers needed to be done there. And then of course we did the HD lipo. So, um, you know, we've now defined her rectus muscles. We've defined her obliques a, a bit. We've really brought in that waist. We got rid of a lot of excess fat in the abdominal area. Uh, here she is, you know, fairly, fairly um, 
soon after surgery, you know, you can still see kind of the, the, the incisions there. They're not fully healed. Um, and then here she is uh, at approximately two months or so post-surgery. So a lot of the swelling has come down. She has taken great care of herself. She's gotten all her massages her, her compression. And you can really start to see that definition there now. So she's got a very well-defined abdomen. Looks like she's been just hitting the gym really hard uh, for the past you know, few weeks or so. Uh, so you can, you can see that definition there very nicely. And then of course, you know, she sends us this, she's extremely happy. She's now three months post-op, she's at the pool, she's hanging out, uh, extremely happy with her body. Again, breast augmentation uh, and HD lipo there, okay? Does your Miami makeover include a breast reduction? So it can, yeah. So it can include a breast reduction as well. So typically it's just like we said, like any kind of breast uh, enhancing type of procedure. So it can be a breast dog, a breast lift, breast reduction or breast lift with implants. Um, and then of course the, uh, the HC lipo. Now, uh, I do want to get into though a little bit as to like who kind of qualifies for this procedure, but because unfortunately it's not for all, all comers and not for all patients because it is typically for patients that are, are on the lower BMI side. Okay. So that's why you probably won't see as many breast reductions with this procedure though you can, uh, because there are thin women with large breasts who want to do a reduction, but, uh, overall, the patient has to be, you know, in relatively good shape already. They got to be in their BMIs probably about uh, 24 or less. Okay. So, um, like I said, we're, we're not really combining this with fat transfer. So it is okay to be in the lower BMI side. So you can be in a BMI of 20, you know, 21, 22 or so, uh, probably up to about 24. Uh, remember, we do have those limits here in Florida so how much like what we can do when we're combining it with the breast procedure. So that's, you know, another reason why the patients should be on the lower BMI side, uh, or that's one of the reasons. Another reason is because in order to kind of define that abdomen and make it look good and make it look, you know, like you've been hitting the gym and not too fake or anything like that. Again, you have to start off with a very, very good foundation with a very, very good base. Uh, and again, you gotta be uh, on that, uh, you know, that BMI can't be too, too high. So you'd say the optimal BMI is 20 to 24? Yeah, I would probably say the optimal BMI is 20 to 24. Um, you know, once you start getting kind of below 20, you know, there may be someone out there with a 19 that might, that, that may do okay. Uh, but you know, for those, those patients, typically they probably just need the breast dog and they don't need the, the HC lipo portion of it. Uh, and then once you start getting above 24, there's probably too much fat in the abdominal area uh, for HC lipo really to work or for those limits, you know, those limits to kick in. And so uh, they'll probably do better actually separating out the procedures um, so that we can remove more fat uh, with the lipo section aspect of it. Uh, and perhaps they, they may not be a candidate for the high definition type of lipo at that point in time. And what kind of implants do you use? Yeah, so that's great. So I like to use, for the, for the most part, I like to use silicone implants, okay? I use Natrell. Uh, there's two major brands here in the U.S. Well, um, you know, there's a smaller one also, but, you know, you have, uh, I like to use Natrell. Um, and these are the gummy bear type of implants. So you may have heard that term. Uh, what does gummy bear mean? It, it is a silicone implant, but it's what's, it, the type of silicone is called a highly cohesive gel, okay? Which means that it's not it's not really like in the liquid form. So if you were to cut those implants thing in half, it would retain its shape because that silicone um, is highly cohesive, okay? Um, and so those are at this point in time about fifth generation silicone implants. They're they're excellent, very very safe, um, and that's what we use now. Also, um, I I always use smooth implants, typically a smooth round implant. Uh, those implants, again, have not been shown to be having any issues. You know, people are always scared about, uh, sometimes they hear about, you know, the ALCL, which is a, a lymphoma related to implants, but that's related only to textured implants, okay? So textured implants, but not smooth, round implants. And is your HD lipo performed with Vaser? How do you get uh, the look? No, so I don't use Vaser. I use uh, what's called power-assisted lipo. Uh, and I use uh, the, the machine that I use is called Micro Air. So, but there is no energy in hand, and, and there's no energy to that in the sense that it's not a laser or it's not ultrasound energy, which is what the Vaser uses, okay? Uh, it's only mechanical or energy, meaning that the, the catalog kind of vibrates and moves back and forth. Um, and does, that does help in terms of, kind of ease of use, um, but we're not imparting any energy to the skin. So that, brings me to a very, very good point. So 
Another thing that is very important in terms of patient selection is the quality of that skin. So HD lipo, as uh, you know, for example, in this patient, uh, works well with people that have very good quality skin. Okay, so that's typically patients that haven't had many pregnancies or any pregnancies, uh, patients that have, don't have stretch marks, patients that are not that never smoked in their life, uh, of course, younger patients. Um, and so all these qualities, you know, like that make you have a you know skin that has um, a lot of bounce back or elasticity, which is very very important. So that's another aspect in terms of HD lipo, which is extremely important that you want to make sure that the patient has good quality skin. So you said that you, this can be done with a breast augmentation, a breast lift, and breast reduction. What's the difference between reduction and a lift? So it's just if you're actually trying to reduce the volume of the breast. So uh, with all breast reductions, you, you, you also get a lift, okay? But really, the, and actually the techniques are very, very similar. Um, so the main difference is how much breast volume are you removing? So if someone, you know, says, you know, hey doc, I want to keep as much of my volume as possible, and then, then that's technically more of a breast lift, even though the scar pattern and everything else is very, very similar. Uh, if someone says, you know, I want to try to come down a cup size or whatnot, uh, then you'll reduce a bit more breast actual tissue uh, and then that becomes more of a breast reduction. When you're doing the HD lipo, because I've seen a lot of HD lipo cases where it looks very fake, how do you, yeah. how do you make sure the lines and everything has a natural look to it? Yeah, so, so, so the first step is kind of what we've been discussing up until now and it's patient selection. You have to be, you have to be very, very picky uh, as to who you think you know, is a good candidate for this procedure. Um, so again, BMI can't be too high, um, and the skin quality has to be good. So those those are those are very very important because, for example, if you try to do this with someone whose BMI is high, they don't. Of course, it'll look fake because it really doesn't. It's not congruent with their body, right? If someone's BMI is very very high and you, and you try to etch it out, then it'll look completely fake. Um, and then if someone's skin quality is poor and that skin doesn't kind of retract back the way that you want and it kind of remains loose. Uh, then of course that could sometimes need it to look a little fake, but for those patients typically what they'll need is then some sort of skin tightening procedure, whether it be something like body tight or a mini tummy tuck or even a full tummy tuck at times uh, to make, you know, to make it look uh, much you know, more natural. But as far as your okay. technique... And then in terms of the technique, mm -hmm. yeah, you. you don't want to be like overly uh, aggressive, okay? So you want to create, you know, those it, basically illusions, okay? Um, but you want to make the transition smooth, okay? I think that's really the key there. So you want you want to etch things out, but not in a way where you have almost like you know like right angles, okay? You want things to be smooth and 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 more, uh, you know, I guess not not so much circular, but not not in right angles. You want things to kind of flow from one area to the other. Uh, and then of course, in terms of uh, knowing your anatomy and how things are supposed to look, of course, is very, very important. And that's where the markings come in uh, before the surgery um, as well. And then lastly, what really makes this procedure work is a commitment by the patients, okay? Because it does take uh, a lot of post-op care and the patient has to be really committed to, you know, to staying in shape, to, to you know, uh, having an adequate diet, to doing all her compression, to doing all her post-operative massages, uh, because you know, if, if you're able to do all that, you can then have, achieve a great result and maintain that result. Okay, because that's the key here. If you then you know you know stop going to the gym or stop working out uh, or you know just you know eat whatever you want and start gaining a bunch of weight. Well, as you gain weight, then you know it's not going to look it's not going to look great. So it is a long kind of a long term commitment for that patient to stay in shape and to stay healthy. Question about a BBL really quick. Yeah. Hi doctor, you did my BBL last year and I'm in love. I have a question. I'm considering a round two BBL, but I have a hernia. Do you do the hernia repair with my round two BBL? So no, I typically don't do hernia repairs with a BBL um, uh, because we're not really opening things up, right? So you, we're mm -hmm. just making little small stab incisions for the catalyst. So, uh, as opposed to say, for example, a tummy tuck. So with a tummy tuck, I do uh, repair, repair hernias because we're opening things up, we're already there, I can repair you know, the fascia, basically the layer that needs to be repaired to close down the hernia. Uh, so if you do have a hernia, especially if it's a significant hernia, then I do recommend getting that hernia fixed first 
and then you know coming into uh, for your BBL. If it's just like a very small kind of a, you know belly button hernia, we can work around that. But if it was anything more significant than that, then it's best to have it fixed before your liposuction or BBL procedure. All right. Before the next question, I have two comments. Yeah. One is. I remember the day that I had my surgery and I woke up from anesthesia and I heard you doing hump day live. It was like, <laughs> so she heard you yelling out that, so All right. that's wonderful. The next is, please give Natalie a huge raise. She is just an amazing human being. So now, oh, okay, shout out props to for Nat. All right, All right, there we go. So she deserves that. <laughs> for the next question is, my lower back has a crease after a BBL. Will another round of lipo help that, help diminish that? Well, actually, um, I mean, of course, to know for sure, I'd have to like look at it and evaluate it. But a lot of times, uh, a crease forms in the back uh, because you know a, a, a certain amount of fat was removed within a relatively rapid period of time, and actually, a, a lot of times that crease is due to skin laxity. So it's more because the skin then became loose, and the skin then kind of folds over and it forms a crease. Okay, so. Um, even though you know I can't give you a definitive answer until I would, I would actually be able to see photos and evaluate everything, um, do know that uh, you know sometimes that's due to the skin being loose, and then and therefore you may be better off with you know adding some sort of skin tightening procedure. And while for the most part I don't recommend you know like like surgical procedures in the back unless you really really need to, like a massive weight loss per, uh, patient, but something like body tight, uh, which is what we use here, or J plasma, which other uh, other surgeons use. Uh, maybe something you want to consider to try to improve an area like that. How long after a BBL can someone come back for lipo or HD lipo? Yeah, so uh, you want to wait at least nine months, okay? At least nine months. So I never like to repeat lipo before that, okay? So uh, there's a little bit of confusion there because some people, you know, there's confusion because of terminology. Uh, so some people are like, oh, I want to do my round two, but are you saying round two the same procedure again? Or are you saying a different procedure? So say for example, if you have a BBL and you want to do a tummy tuck, um, I wouldn't really call that a round two, I just call that your, your next stage surgery, and that you can do three to four months out. But if you're doing the same kind of procedure again, meaning you've had a BBL and you want a full round two BBL, so maybe we're, we're doing liposuction and fat transfer again, then you want to wait a minimum of nine months. Minimum of nine months, okay? If you can wait a little longer, even better. I think a, a year or, you, or even a little bit more than a year is ideal, uh, but you certainly shouldn't be done before then. What's the reason? So before that, uh, you're still, you know, believe it or not, whether you feel it or not, you're gonna have a certain degree of inflammation. There's gonna be a certain degree of, you know, fibrosis, and it makes repeating the lipo very, very difficult, okay? And very, very bloody as well. Okay, so if you go like so very soon after, it's almost like trying to chisel through concrete, uh, which makes it you know more difficult, more bloody, more dangerous. Okay, and so the longer you wait, the longer you wait for that whole inflammatory process to basically to calm down, the better it'll be, and also it's more beneficial to you, also in the sense that you'll be able to get more fat out. So when there's a lot of inflammation, a lot of kind of scar tissue and stuff going on, uh, you're not going to be able to remove as much fat. Uh, as you know, if you wait a bit longer and wait for all that inflammatory process to kind of die down, uh, and and then you know, like I said, it's going to be easier for the surgeon, less bloody, less dangerous, and you're going to be able to have more fat extraction. So those are all the reasons why you got to wait. You should wait at least nine months. Thank you very much. Next question is a patient of yours. I've booked with you already. All right. I have previous lipo that's a little lumpy. I'm only 22 years old. Will you be able to help resolve this during our surgery? Yeah, so again, so yeah, if it's due to, you know, the area, if it's due to fibrosis, okay, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times, you know, just repeating the lipo, kind of lifting things up again and trying to smooth things out underneath, um, that'll help, okay? Um, if it's due to maybe, you know, certain areas where the skin wasn't able to retract well, you know, we could take a look at that when I, you know, physically can examine you in person and determine whether maybe something like body type would help that area. I mean, you're young, you're probably not done having kids, of course, so you, know, you want something less invasive in terms of skin tightening, so body type uh, would be a very good uh, option for you. So you use body type, not J-plasma to type the skin because of I, that? So yeah, yeah. so the, the two um, energy, the, the way that the two machines work are very similar in the sense that they both use radio frequency type energy, okay? Um, and those are the two kind of big names out there, at least here in the U.S. Um, I like the body type because 
it's uh, I feel like it's a little bit co more controlled. So it has a lot of feedback mechanisms where it tells me whether you know the skin's getting too hot. Uh, and so I like that in terms from a safety measure, you know, it basically alarms, you know, if anything, uh, you know, before anything, uh, any like big burn or anything like that were to happen. So I like the feedback mechanisms on the body type. I also like the fact that it's a little bit more versatile in the sense that it has multiple hand pieces. So you have like the very large ones for large areas like the abdomen or the arms. And then you have one that's kind of in the middle for say like chin and neck area. And then it has a really, the really, really tiny one that you can use for like you know, nasal labial folds or lower eyelids and stuff like that. So I like that um, as well. So because for all those reasons, I use the body type, but again, the, the, the way that they work, the energy that they use uh, are very, very similar. All right, so I have a question or comment from the same person. <laughs> comment first. Can you also give Yanisi a raise? You're gonna... <laughs> <laughs> all right. You'll be paying a lot right. today. We're doing a lot of raises yeah. today. <laughs> Sounds and good. Do you do lipoma removal with a BBL? Um, so... You can remove a lipoma via liposuction, okay? Uh, as long as you know you're, you're sure that it's a lipoma, which is a benign, uh, you know, it's a benign, basically fatty growth. Uh, and so then it's okay to remove that with liposuction. Uh, can it potentially grow back? It can, it's a possibility. Uh, and then when you do that, you, you kind of do everything else, and then when you're, when you're gonna go to liposuction, the lipoma, you separate it from everything else because you're not gonna use that fat to, for the fat transfer. That fat, you know, you throw away, basically, you put it in the in the garbage can, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that can be done at that time, yeah. So body type is a skin tightening procedure. Yeah. Does it work on all body parts and does it reduce the appearance of cellulite? So it is a skin tightening procedure. You can use it for pretty much most areas of the body, um, but it does not necessarily treat cellulite, okay? So unfortunately, we don't have uh, currently any great solutions to cellulite um, you know some people ask if uh, fat transfer or BBL will treat the cellulite in the buttock uh, a lot of times it does not so I've seen you know I've seen some patients where it's gotten a little bit better for most patients it remains very very similar I've even seen one or two patients where it got a little bit worse uh, although that's that's very 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 few um, and then you know Liposuction in and of itself doesn't work that great uh, for cellulite and body type uh, is also not the best solution for that either. There is a, a procedure out there, it's called um, Selfina. Uh, I don't, we don't do that here at Pure, uh, but there are places that do it that have, I would say, you know, decent results. Um, but again, unfortunately, up, up until now, we don't have a great solution for cellulite. So we have another comment. This might make you angry, but uh, I probably shouldn't say this until after you do my surgery, but go Tar Heels. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. All right, with the dude. Uh, no, 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 we gotta, we gotta, we gotta you know, stay, stick with the Blue Devils here. <laughs> uh, but no, that's great. You still, still take care of her. That's right. All right. <laughs> Next question is, what are the chances of getting capsular contracture if you're going from small breasts to large implants? Okay, so, well, the, the size of the implants and everything else doesn't really determine, you know, the chance of capsular contracture, mm -hmm. so, um, unfortunately, even after years and years of research, we don't have a, a, a very good explanation as to why some patients get a capsular contracture and others don't. Um, there's a couple of, of theories out there that are not completely proven, uh, but based on those theories, we try to do things to try to minimize the risk. So, one of the theories as to why there's capsular contracture is because some uh, people say that there is, you know, some degree of kind of bacteria or contamination where it's not enough to actually cause an infection, but it does lead to an inflammatory response, which then leads to the capsular contracture. Oh. So because of that, then we always wash out the pocket before placing the implant with antibiotic solutions and beta dye solutions. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's one of the steps that we take to try to minimize that risk. Uh, there's another theory that says, um, you know, there's bleeding or blood in the pocket. Um, that that may also lead to an inflammatory response that can lead to capsular contracture. So of course you want to be very, very meticulous with your hemostasis. You want to make sure that before you place that implant, that basically the pocket is completely dry and there's no bleeding points um, as well. So that's something else that we try to do. Uh, but at the end of the day, even if you do all that, some people still develop a capsular contracture and we don't know exactly why. Um, it is some sort of inflammatory response. Uh, patients that have uh, either autoimmune diseases or 
uh, tend to like keloid or have hypertrophic scars, they tend to have a higher chance also of capsular contracture. So it has to do a little bit with how the body deals with that, that foreign object, which is the implant. Um, and, and while in most patients, it just basically walls it off in a nice little soft uh, capsule, there, you know, in certain patients that capsule becomes thickened and sometimes also it even calcifies. Um, and when it's kind of a, a later stage mm -hmm. or more severe capsular contraction. Thank you. Now we have a time sensitive question. Okay. I would like to book and get lipo and BBL before my wedding, but there isn't much time ahead. What's the minimum recovery time that you recommend to be ready for a wedding? To be ready for a wedding, you know, I would, I would recommend probably at least three months. Okay. So even though after six weeks, you can, you know, start being more active, heading back to the gym and everything mm -hmm. like that. Um, you know, your body's still not completely healed. Things haven't completely settled. Um, and so if you're, if you're planning a big event, which of course, you know, a wedding is, um, I would, you know, to be on the safer side, I would give yourself at least three months. Um, by that time, you should start to see a little bit more of the final results. A lot of that swelling and inflammation uh, had, would uh, come down and things will start to settle uh, around that period of time. During all your lipo 360 cases, included the liposuction done during the BBL, do you get the upper back? So we get most of the back. So the back we get from, uh, from above the bra line down, mm -hmm. okay? So the, the one part that we don't get is what we, what some people call the buffalo hump, which is that area kind of right in here, okay? So if you have that, then that would be considered an additional area, okay? Uh, but pretty much other than that, we get pretty much most of the upper mid and lower back. What's the quickest way to lower your BMI before my mommy makeover? Um, you want to uh, you want to do that safely. Yeah, mm -hmm. you don't. Want, it's not so much about the quickest way, but you want to do it in a healthy way, okay? Uh, because say if you go on like on a crash diet or something like that, yeah, you may lose weight quickly, but then you're gonna be malnourished. Right? We don't have the the proteins and the nutrients and the vitamins and everything that you need, and you're gonna need all that to heal. Because you know, body makeover is a big procedure, it involves you know, a breast procedure, a tummy tuck, large incisions, a lot of dissection, um, and you're gonna want, you're gonna need all that to heal. Okay, so my recommendation is try not to lose much more than say one to two pounds a week. Um, for most people, I would say probably one pound a week. Okay, and then kind of focus on that um, as you get to your your goal. Okay, but losing you know much more than that, um, you do kind of enter this kind of malnourished. Uh, type of stage um, and then that's not the best way to then go into surgery uh, because your chances of say wound breakdown infection just stuff like that you know your body just doesn't have the same ability to heal uh, as you would when you're when you have all, you know all the nutrients uh, that you need so if I came in and got face tight on my chin how long would I have to wear a garment around my face before I can actually go in public go to work yeah um, so so one of the, the the issues that we have with um, when we do, you know, face tight and stuff like that, mm -hmm. is that you do have to wear that chin garment, and that a lot of people are not very compliant with it because you know it, it, it's wrapped around your face, it's it's itchy, it, you know, you you want to see people in public and stuff like that. So what do I tell my patients? I say, you know, you really want to wear this as much as you can for the first six weeks. And the more that you wear it, the better. The first two weeks, you, you should really be wearing it 24/7. Okay, after that, if you have to take it off for a couple hours because you're at work or you're seeing people or you're being in public, um, okay, but as soon as you're, you're done with that, put it back on, certainly have it you know, while you're in the house, at night while you're sleeping, because the more time that you can spend in it in the first six weeks, the better the long-term uh, result's gonna be. Okay, so I know it's tough, but you know, compliance is very, very important with that type of procedure. So for in-town patients after surgery, can they just go home versus an out-of-town patients, when can they go home? So yeah, I mean, if you live nearby, of course, you, you can go home, you can recover at home, and, and then we'll still see you kind of at the same interval. So your, your post-up day one visit, uh, we'll do that virtually. So we'll do that virtually from home. Then we'll see you around post-up day five or so in person in clinic. Uh, and then because, unfortunately, I, I thought we could, <laughs> we'd kind of be uh, over it by now, but because COVID is so, so rampant at this time, um, we're still trying to do most of our six week and three month follow-ups virtually as well. Okay. Okay. Um, so that's also very similar for out of town patients. 
you know, we'll still do the virtual uh, visit one day, you know, post-op day one. We'll see them here in person post-op day five. They'll still get their virtual visit uh, six weeks at three and three months. Um, but the difference is, of course, eventually you have to go home. So you have to be here in Miami a minimum of five days post-op. So I'm not talking about your entire trip because uh, what I'm talking about is how many days you have to be here after surgery and the minimum is five, okay? So the entire trip might be easily, you know, seven or eight days. Uh, but the key is that you shouldn't leave and you sh certainly shouldn't be on a plane before five days post-op because your risk of blood clots, DVTs, and PEs goes way up. Thank you. Do you remove butt injections? No, actually, uh, I don't. Um, it's a very, very tricky procedure. Uh, it can get to quite bloody and things at times. Uh, it's a challenging procedure, I'll be honest. Uh, so I don't do that. Uh, I know of a couple colleagues here in Miami that do, uh, but, uh, but I don't. Does an upside down heart shaped BBL lead to a droopy bottom? I don't think so. Not if done, not if done uh, in a non-exaggerated way. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so, you know, we get this all the time, you know, a lot of times you know, people are like, you know, doc, just put in as much as you, as you can, uh, or you know, I want as much projection and all this stuff. And, you know, uh, you know, people that know me and follow me know, know that I try to do things that, um, what I call either, uh, or what I, what I was calling, uh, basically enhanced natural, but uh, I think a better term that's come out there is called soft vixen. And I think it's really something that you want to go for where yes, it's enhanced. Yes. You have a nice shape and everything else, but nothing is like too, too exaggerated or stuck on or having an ant type of look because whether that might be okay while you're young, you know, over the course of, you know, of the years, as you start to get old, older, as skin, you know, elasticity starts to break down and skin starts to stretch and you have, you know, the pool of gravity on your body, uh, then, you know, then yes, things will start to kind of sag uh, and give you a kind of an aged appearance to the buttock. So, so uh, I think, you know, you got to think long term. You, you don't want to do anything too exaggerated. You want things to be, you know, to go flow seamlessly with the rest of the body so that you don't run into those issues in the future. If I had a breast augmentation a few years ago and now I'm breastfeeding, will that change my results? So you had the augmentation first and then you had a pregnancy and then of course now you're breastfeeding. Yes. Yeah, very likely it will. So, um, you know, when, when you go through pregnancy, the breasts tend to swell, okay? And then after that you do breastfeeding and then they, you know, basically all that starts to come down. And a lot of times what happens is because breast tissue reacts to pregnancy and hormones and everything else, but implants don't, right? Implants are inert. But the breast, after having been stretched out and then coming back down, then tends to droop, okay? And so then the breast starts to droop over that implant. And you have a lot of times what we call a snoopy type of, of deformity, where the breast is kind of falling over the implant, okay? And so typically that's gonna require another procedure. Uh, usually that procedure is an implant exchange with breast lift. We've exceeded the half hour mark. I, every week it goes by really quick. So I know we have to right. go soon. Uh, we can address a few more questions if you... Yeah, let's take a couple more. We're, uh, we're, we uh, started early here today, so that's right. Great. Can you get another BBL with fat necrosis? You can. Okay, so fat necrosis. What is fat necrosis? Uh, fat necrosis is when some of the fat that you've transferred doesn't live. It neither, it neither was able to live, nor was it absorbed. And so what happens is that basically it kind of clumped down into a scar ball and we call that scar ball fat necrosis because basically that fat died, okay? Is fat necrosis in and of itself something dangerous? No, it's not. You can just think of it as a scar ball in that area, okay? It doesn't cause, you know, like a health issue or anything like that. In some patients it can be uncomfortable and some patients because maybe when you're sitting in certain ways it can be a little bit painful but it's not, you know, like a, like a, you know, like a health issue. Okay. Um, so how do you deal with fat necrosis? Well, of course, if you wanted to deal with it definitively, you would make an incision and you would cut it out. I think for the, for most patients, I think that's too aggressive. Okay. A, you're going to leave a scar in the buttock now and B, once you remove that, you're going to leave basically a dent. Okay. And you can't really fill that dent in immediately because if you're feeling, if you're, if you create another pool of fat, and the chances that I make forms uh, fat necrosis again are pretty high, okay? So for most patients, what I like to do is actually try to break 
up that scar ball with the cannula. So break it from, from like a ball that's whatever, maybe that size, you break it up into multiple small pieces and then your body has a better chance of absorbing it. It doesn't feel like such a large kind of clump anymore. It's not as, uh, it doesn't cause as much discomfort, okay? And then of course you can, you can fat graft, you know, into or over that area and create a little bit more padding around that area, okay? So a little bit of a long-winded answer, but the, the short answer is yes, you can do it. Uh, but you have to you know, take all these things into consideration. So you have a patient that's traveling here from Alaska to do her surgery. All right. The flight is 13 hours. So will that affect, because she's going to be on the flight for a very long time, her travel back? Yeah. So uh, for any, any flight over three hours, patients must have the circulate. The okay. circulate is a sequential compression device, okay, mm -hmm. that you attach to, to the leg in the calf area and it squeezes and lets go and keeps the circulation of the legs moving and protects you from uh, what we call DVTs, okay, and PEs. Um, so if your flight's over three hours for any procedure, you must have a circulate. We've also recently started instituting uh, pretty much everyone that has a mommy makeover must have a circulate regardless of how long your flight is, okay, uh, and also tummy tucks. So tummy tucks, mommy makeover, circulate 100% for sure. Anyone with a flight over three hours for any other procedure should definitely have a circulate as well. My question is, I'll be two weeks post-op. Can I sit on the BBL pillow? Yeah. Yeah. So at two weeks, you can do that. Um, so that's exactly right. For the first two weeks, try to minimize sitting as much as you can. Of course, there's going to be times where you have to, right? If you're traveling, you're flying, things like that. And during those times, you'll use your BBL pillow. After about two weeks, you can use your BBL pillow a bit more liberally. Uh, as long as you're using it correctly, then that's okay. So you're, you're, placing, you're placing it in a way that you're putting the pressure in the thigh and you're allowing kind of the hips and buttock to kind of hang off the back, uh, minimizing pressure there. All right, before I let you go, um, generally, how long after consultation are the, do you usually schedule the surgery? Well, right now we're <laughs> so right now we're pretty booked out. So right now we're, we're kind of booked through June, okay. Uh, but you know there are times where there's you know there are there is a wait list, okay. So because anytime there's a cancellation or something like that, then we try to you know bring people off that wait list, wait list, kind of get them in as soon as we can. So mm -hmm. um, you know what I recommend is of course you know send in all your information. If you need a surgery date sooner, you know send everything in. Uh, so that we can put you on that wait list, okay, so that you're kind of in, in the queue. The other thing I would say that it also depends a little bit on the procedure, right? Because if you have a long procedure, it's a little bit tougher to fit in. So say like a mommy makeover uh, or what we call a trifecta, which is a mommy makeover with an with a arm lift or brachioplasty. Those are, of course, much, much tougher to fit in uh, or even BBL. Uh, then say a short procedure such as a breast dog. So breast dog typically takes me about 30 minutes. So that's something that can be fit in much, much more, uh, much more easily, excuse me, uh, or something like the Miami makeover. So Miami makeover typically won't take more than an hour and a half or so, like 30 minutes uh, for the breast dog, about you know an hour or less uh, for the HD, and that's a procedure that we can certainly try to. Uh, it's much, much uh, more easily, uh, more easy to fit in. Excuse me. Thank you so much. All right. Is it, is it that time, or do we have time for more? All right, everybody. <laughs> I think we're good, so right. um, stay tuned, okay, for uh, the Hump Day Lives, but I just want to remind everyone that if you want to see some of the ones we've done in the past, uh, you can go to the IGTV at, at Pure Plastic Surgery, okay, on Instagram, or you can go to the YouTube channel there. We have very, many, many great videos of all these topics that we've discussed, uh, anywhere, you know, any, pretty much anything ranging uh, from like, you know, how to prepare a pre-op to potential complications uh, to you know descriptions of the procedures and things like that. Okay, so make sure you check that out. All right, but I'll see all of you again next Wednesday on Hump Day with Dr. Alex Earl. Take care, everybody. Ciao.